Live from Ottawa, Encounter 79, an exchange of views by the leaders of Canada's three major political parties on the issues of the 1979 federal election. The moderator tonight is the distinguished lawyer and academic, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Western Ontario, and incoming principal or president of McGill University, David Johnston. Good evening. I am honored to preside for the next two hours over this historic meeting. For the first and only time in this election campaign, the leaders of Canada's three major political parties have gathered together to confront each other on the issues which now concern the nation. This unique occasion for voters from coast to coast has been arranged by the parties and the pooled efforts of the CBC, CTV, and global television networks. The parties and the networks have agreed on the following format. Each leader will make a three-minute opening statement. The order of speaking has been drawn by lot. The first speaker will be the leader of the official opposition and of the progressive conservative party, Joe Clark. The second speaker will be the Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. The third speaker will be the leader of the New Democratic Party, Ed Broadbent. After these opening remarks, there will be a debate period divided into three 30-minute rounds. In the first, Mr. Clark will face Mr. Broadbent. Mr. Trudeau will not be involved, but will remain on the set. In the second half hour, Mr. Broadbent will face Mr. Trudeau with Mr. Clark at his place, but not involved. In the final round, Mr. Trudeau will face Mr. Clark with Mr. Broadbent not involved, but on the set. We also have in the studio the senior parliamentary reporters for the three networks, David Halton from the CBC, Peter Deborah from Global, and Bruce Phillips from CTV. Each round will begin with a question from this panel to one of the leaders, and the journalists will be asking questions when appropriate during the evening. The three journalists have worked together to develop the questions and themes which will be raised. After the three rounds, each leader will have up to four minutes for closing remarks, speaking in the reverse order of the opening statements. We have tried to keep the formal rules short and simple in order to encourage the leaders to engage fully in discussion with each other. In the rounds, they have the right to reply and counter-reply to any answer given in response to a journalist's question, and they should feel free to discuss the issue back and forth between themselves until they have considered it dealt with. The leaders may also ask questions of one another. My role as moderator is to ensure that the time limits are respected, that the principle of equal time is fairly recognized, that the proper order is followed, and that opportunities exist for questions. The participants have agreed to refrain from speaking when I intervene and to accept my judgment as to when their comments should be terminated. We begin then with the opening remarks of the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Mr. Clark, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Broadbent, uh, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I very much enjoyed the opportunity over the last several years, really, now, to get out across the country to talk to many of you about the issues that you feel face our country. And what I wanted to do tonight in opening this portion of the debate was to speak about some of the goals which my colleagues and I think the country, working together, should be able to achieve in the next four years. I start with the understanding that we're very fortunate to live in a nation like Canada. Not only do we have tremendous physical resources, and in fact a physical potential, a resource potential that no other nation in the world can match, but we also have skilled individuals, and we have people who are living and working within a tradition of wanting to go out and build this country. We also have here in Canada institutions which have worked very well in this country when they've been given the chance to work. Now, in the last 11 years, things have not been going as well as they should. There's a lot we have to change. 
but mainly that has to be in the attitudes and the policies of the Ottawa government. In the last 11 years, we've seen a government in Ottawa that has encouraged Canadians to be divided one against another, has created divisions and allowed divisions to develop more severe than at any time in our, in our history as a country. We've allowed unemployment in Canada to rise to levels which I personally find simply unacceptable for a nation of our wealth, a nation of our traditions. And we've seen the Trudeau government undermine institutions, whether the parliamentary system or the very effective way in which the federal-provincial relations have worked together in the past. We believe that a new government, formed by a new team of Canadians who are proud of this country, confident about this country, who represent the whole of Canada, will be much better able to deal with the, the problems and the opportunities arising in the next four years than the old government would. We'd follow mainly three, potent, three main priorities. The first would be to restore the spirit of cooperation to federal-provincial relations in Canada. That has been there with every successful prime minister in our history, from Sir John A. Macdonald right through to Lester B. Pearson. I believe that what we need is a federal government that will be strong where it has to be strong, but that will be reasonable where it should be reasonable. Next, we clearly have to get the Canadian economy growing much faster than it has been. We have to find jobs for that million Canadians who are now out of work. We have to find skills for those young, young Canadians who are looking for work, don't have experience, don't have the skills they need. And finally, we have to build upon the great natural strengths of this country. That's the goal that my colleagues and I set for Canada. That's the goal we've been setting forward in this national election campaign. That's the goal which, with your help, we would want to begin to accomplish on the 22nd of May, working in partnership with you then and in the, the days of government afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. We now turn to the leader of the Liberal Party, Mr. Trudeau. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, gentlemen. Well, I'm happy to be in this debate, too. I know that the three of us have been traveling around the country for the past seven weeks and talking to crowds, often to our own supporters. But we've never met like this, and uh, I think that there are millions of people watching us who want to know how we approach this election. I see it as one about the future. I hope we will have in the half-hour debate occasion to look at the record a little bit and challenge some of these gloomy views of Mr. Clark. But uh, I see the election about the future, about what kind of a Canada we want to have. And I think that's what the people want to hear in this election. Whether I'm on a campus or in a high school or in a senior citizen's home or meeting with working men and women, they say, well, what kind of a Canada will we have? What is the future like? What will our place be in it? How will we be able to retire in security? What about the young people? Will we be able to move and choose our place in this country? And our answer is, well, this election is meant to answer those kind of questions. Listen to the parties, listen to your candidates, and choose then those men and women who are able to put forward views of Canada and policies for it, which will make it strong, which will keep it united, and make it even more prosperous. And I hope once again that in the debate we'll be able to deal with the future more than with the past, though I'm very happy to deal with the record. But the future is what we want to talk about. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. Finally, we will hear from the leader of the New Democratic Party, Mr. Broadbent, please. Good evening, Mr. Clark, Mr. Trudeau. Canadians out there, we are indeed entering the final phase of a very important election campaign. I've enjoyed traveling the past seven weeks all over this country, meeting Canadians in every kind of occupation. And now, uh, having had that pleasure and excitement, and it's been real for me, you have an opportunity to express very shortly an extremely serious opinion. You're going to have the right, important right, to decide which party and which man are best able to lead this country into a future that is going to be more decent and more exciting. In the past few weeks, I've been very precise about the things that we think ought to be done. I've said that when prices are going up much faster than wages and salaries, we need a Fair Prices Commission that can not only investigate rising prices, but when they're unjustifiably high, roll them back. I have said that we must return to a system of universal Medicare, so that there won't be one system of medical service for the rich and another for the poor. I have said that when people need housing, 
We have to do something about mortgages for middle and low income Canadians, but we also have to do something for all those Canadians who need more rental accommodation. And I have also stressed for Canadian women that when they enter the labour market, they ought to have precisely the same rights as Canadian men. And for Western farmers who are anticipating with a great deal of eagerness increased export markets in the years ahead, I have said a Government of Canada exercising its responsibility will make sure that we have a transportation system that will enable them to meet their export commitments. But above all in this campaign, for me, I think there's one issue that stands uh, head and shoulders above the rest. And that is I have urged my fellow Canadians that it's time that we established in this country of ours what's long existed in all the other modern nations of this world, in Western Europe, in Japan, in them all. And that's an industrial strategy. And for Canadians, an industrial strategy really means getting control of our own resources and ensuring that we here in Canada get the jobs from those resources. I have said it's time that Canadian resources were owned by Canadians, controlled by Canadians, and used for the benefit of Canadians. It's time, in short, for a new beginning. It's time to bring Canada home to Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Broadbent. Now that we've heard the opening statements from all three party leaders, we begin the first one-to-one -one encounter between Mr. Clark and Mr. Broadbent. Mr. Trudeau will not participate, but will remain at his place. Mr. Halton, you have the first question, please. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. I'd like to start by asking Mr. Clark to explain what, for many Canadian voters, is a baffling contradiction in Tory policy. You blame liberal spending and the large deficit right now for Canada's inflation, but you yourself, in the course of this campaign, have made promises that would, as you admit, increase the deficit. Aren't you on both sides of the fences on it? Not at all, and I think that Mr. Broadbent will probably uh, agree with the view that what we have to do to get, the, to get an economy that is uh, running now well below its potential, growing towards that full potential, is to uh, introduce some stimulus right now. The kind of stimulus that a progressive conservative government wants to introduce is stimulus that would allow individual Canadians to begin spending some of their own money on things that they think are necessary in this country to begin to get growth. Uh, what we have to do is get the... Uh, the size of the economic pie, which governments can tax, growing much more near its, its full capacity than is, uh, than is now the case. There's nothing at all new about this. Uh, President Kennedy did it in the early 1960s with uh, very positive effects, uh, uh, leading the United States from a deficit towards a surplus position. Indeed, John Turner did it in the budget of 1972, cutting taxes, giving money back to Canadians so they could spend that money in ways that would uh, increase uh, substantially the... Uh, uh, the general wealth of the country and consequently bring more money into government. Now, we've specified some ways that will be, uh, we think, very effective in doing that. We propose to allow Canadians to deduct a portion of their mortgage interest payments and of their property tax. We propose to allow to uh, lower and middle-income Canadians a tax cut averaging about $300 uh, per taxpayer. Those are people who will use that money quickly in Canada uh, to stimulate growth and purchase and activity in this country. Uh, we think it will generate new revenues for the Government of Canada, which we would intend to use, not to create new spending, but to reduce the, the deficits that uh, have accumulated over the last 11 years. And our goal, very clearly, is to move this country towards a balanced budget. We think that we will be much closer to a balanced budget after four years of policy of that kind. Well, Mr. Clark, if I can come in sure. on this point, what's bothered me particularly about your statements at different times than Mr. Stevens is that, uh, at one, on the one hand, you've argued, yes, we should have uh, a stimulating deficit uh, budget of the kind that we have proposed and laid out very specific suggestions, which we have contended by having capital investment in energy projects now, housing projects now. We would reduce unemployment insurance payouts. We would increase tax revenue because people would be uh, employed that uh, aren't now employed. But we've been at least consistent in that. We haven't uh, tried, in, in my view, to trick the people of Canada and say, on the one hand, yes, we will increase the deficit now. Uh, but at the same time have, in the case of Mr. Stevens, one of your financial spokesmen, and yourself on other occasions, say you would have a balanced budget. We have said ca categorically we can stimulate now. They have done it in other countries. They've done it in Western Europe recently with a net effect, in fact, of three years of 
having an overall reduction in the budget. And what has bothered me about your approach to this campaign, frankly, is that you've seemed to have it, try to have it both ways. You said, yes, you can stimulate the budget, but simultaneously you and Mr. Stevenson have said on different occasions you will have a balanced budget. Now, I, I for one, simply can't understand that contradiction. Well, I think, Mr. Broadbent, you and I certainly agree on, uh, on the goal and certainly agree on the, the need for stimulus now. I think we probably disagree fundamentally about uh, two things. One is whether it is most effective to have that stimulus through the private sector, which I believe, or have it more if emphatically through the public sector with government now, spending me, money. Scott, the question I'm posing with you, because I think it's an important question of credibility, is not that. There are differences there. We've come out for the private sector as well as public sector spending. You need both in a mixed economy. What I'm saying is I think it's very important to be candid in the election. And what I get from the conservative campaign is a kind of trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, you're, you're trying to say to all those Canadians who want a, a balanced budget now, yes, we'll have a balanced budget, and yet at the same time you're saying no. Now, I'd, I'd really like to know definitively uh, where you stand in the issue. I guess Are you saying you're going to have a balanced budget in the coming year or not? I guess, Mr. Broadbent, I'll simply have to ask you to try a little harder to understand exactly what we're saying. What we're saying is that we would put a much greater reliance upon the private sector than you would, because we think that the likely, likelihood of uh, real stimulus, creating real jobs that will last, is going to be much more dramatic uh, through the private sector. Uh, we think that uh, uh, that, that will generate the, uh, the revenue base on which governments can draw. Uh, we think that whether it happens this year, it will certainly happen by the, by the end of the, uh, the, f the first four years of a, of a conservative government, that we will have the, the deficit, uh, uh, the, uh, much, uh, the, the budget much nearer balance than it is right now. Now, I could uh, discuss with so, you whether... So you're saying it's, you, you're going to have... Or, or, it'll be uh, near or a balanced budget, but you're not prepared to say that you're going to increase the deficit uh, in, the, in the coming year. We, we expect that, uh, that in the coming fiscal year, we expect that there will, in fact, not be a deepening of the deficit after, after the first full fiscal year. I can't predict well, that. Well, I can't see... Uh, uh, I, I, just, just a uh, second. Well, let, me, I like, let, me finish, let me finish, if I might. Yes. We can't say that, as no one can, with absolute certainty. But our expectation is that there will be no... Uh, uh, no increase in the deficit after the first fiscal year in which these measures are in operation. We think we will be able to generate enough growth quickly uh, to broaden the tax base that will, uh, uh, that will cause the revenues of the, of the government of Canada to increase. Now, naturally, well, we're I'll, also going to be cutting if I, some... If I may just have a get a word in, Mr. Sure. Clark, that uh, it's not only myself, but the Financial Post and every, <clears throat> every newspaper in the financial section that I've read has disagreed with you. They said your proposal will, in fact, substantially increase the, the deficit this year, and I'm surprised that you aren't prepared to say that. But I, I have another very serious concern well, before, about an energy just question, before we, and that's before petrocan. We get on, before we get on Would you clarify... That? For us, Mr. Brown, your yeah. position on Petrocan. please, Mr. Clark, you uh, comment on yeah. the first point, sure. and then I'd you like can move to the second. You, you, you'd like it probably be better, Mr. Broadbent, if we both cool down a little bit and, well, I'm, uh, I'm and very uh, cool. carry, I just carry want this, this debate this answer. way. Sure, uh, we think that uh, we can very likely, in all likelihood, have uh, uh, the deficit lower after the end of the first fiscal year in which these programs are in operation uh, than than we will going into it. Uh, that can't be be uh, predicted with absolute certainty. Nothing in this world can, but we believe that can happen, uh, particularly since we're going to be at the same time we're cutting the taxes of Canadians to help uh, individual Canadians contribute to economic growth. We're also going to be cutting the cost of government. Uh, we may disagree well on that, on that, but uh, that's my well, position. Well, if we've talked clear. about def you had your question on, on the economy, maybe we could shift ground to a different topic. I, I don't see how you're going to avoid with your kind of spending proposals having a massive deficit, but I I, I have argued uh, in this country we need a, a national petroleum company uh, like Petrocan that would be the exclusive importer of oil, particularly serving the needs of Atlantic Canada and the province of Quebec so that we don't get into the bind we were in uh, a few months ago with, with a multinational oil company threatening to cut off what was duly uh, our, our required shipment of oil. Uh, we proposed it. In fact, we forced, if I may put it uh, bluntly, Mr. Trudeau's government to introduce Petrocan back in 1973. And I simply can't understand your position on this when virtually every other country in the world, with the exception of the United States, which doesn't need it because the multi most of the multinationals are, are there, why the Conservative Party of Canada is prepared to leave us uh, being held to ransom by multinational oil companies, why you want to get rid of Petrocan? Well, we, I think, as I think you know, we certainly do not want this country to be left uh, held to ransom by multinationals. Uh, we want a company like Petrocan in one instance, in that we want a company that is owned <coughs> by Canadians, but we would prefer to have it owned by the Canadian state, uh, Canadian citizen, rather than by the Canadian state. 
But we do not want a company like Petrocan in another instance. And Petrocan has yet to find a drop of oil. It's, it's the only company I know of whose major acquisitions have been in the boardrooms of other nations. Well, that's it, it the case. That's, uh, that's conservative propaganda. They've, they've, they're the only people doing exploration in the Arctic now. They've done it off uh, uh, the Atlantic provinces. Uh, they've, mainly, they've, uh, in fact, they've made a good profit. Mainly uh, in joint ventures, uh, Mr. Broadbent, well, as you, the as you will is, know. Well, the, the point is, Mr. Clark, they've done it as a public enterprise. They made a profit last year for the people of Canada. Instead of our exporting the profits that now go out in, in oil through Shell, uh, through Esso, uh, through Gulf, the people of Canada, through Petrocan, are now making a profit, and we've got an enterprise that, in fact, is the only one doing the exploration in the Arctic now. The big multinationals aren't even there. The and it's your party that wants to get rid of that and, and leave us back to the situation we were with, with the multinationals. The point is that Petrocan has uh, yet to make any, any discoveries. They may well. I hope they do. Uh, I'm convinced that they will be more successful as a company uh, if they are not only owned by private Canadian citizens, but also directed by people who are, whose expertise is in the oil industry and uh, uh, not in government, because I think that, among other That's things... precisely what they have. Me, they have a lot of experts just, in just the field. I'd like to finish, if yes. I could, sure. Uh, also, with an ability to uh, attract, because of that kind of management, uh, the kind of excellence in the oil industry that very often will not now stay with a state company because they fear that some of the geologists do, that that might affect their ability to go to other, to other, uh, other companies. But let's deal with the international question for a moment. You say you want uh, uh, Petrocan to be there in a position to, uh, uh, to, uh, to purchase when we, when we have emergencies. We certainly have to have that capacity. We had it before Petrocan. The, the bargain wasn't very good. But the people who are now with the National Energy Board, who are now expert in international oil pricing, are people who, uh, I think, in an emergency, would probably be able to protect the Canadian national interest far better than, uh, than Petrocan does. And well, I certainly well, agree with Clark, you absolutely every... about, about, the need, about the need for us to have in this country a policy of energy self-sufficiency that will stop the foolish situation where the five eastern provinces of Canada, which happen to be the five poorest, in many ways the five most dependent upon energy, are left to rely upon foreign sources. And what I say to you is that your kind of policy, I fear, uh, would drive away those private sector companies, which are still going to be highly important, still are highly important in exploration well, in this country. Can I make just gentlemen, two, sure. gentlemen, two points? Gentlemen, thank you very much for your okay. comments on this question. Good. Let's move to the next one. I'm sure we'll get back to this issue. Mr. Deborah, please. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I was afraid that Mr. Broadbent was going to run through my whole list of questions before I got in here. Mr. Broadbent, uh, as you know, the McDonald inquiry has been sitting during this election campaign, yes. and it's one of the uh, issues that hasn't taken uh, a great deal of uh, precedence or public attention. Mr. Clark has said that uh, he would permit uh, police violations of civil liberties under certain circumstances. He may want to clarify that. Uh, your own party has professed to be outraged by violations of civil liberties uh, committed by the RCMP. Is there a real substantial difference between yourself and Mr. Clark on that, or is this just a matter of campaign rhetoric? Oh, I think there's an unequivocal difference. I was very surprised and somewhat concerned, I must say, uh, in a liberal democracy to hear Mr. Clark make the statement that he did. Uh, for me, uh, it is a defining characteristic of a democracy that there's one law for you, Mr. Deborah, there's one law for the man or woman who, who farms outside of Moose Jaw, uh, there's one law for uh, an auto worker in my constituency, and it's precisely the same law that holds for the police and politicians. You can't have it both ways. We saw in the United States what can happen if you have a practice in which, in that particular instance, the President of the United States opted for what I understood to be Mr. Clark's position, namely that the, the head of a government can, in fact, transcend the law of the nation. Well, I think that goes against the whole spirit, the whole essence of liberal democracy, and therefore I, in the context of this campaign, made it abundantly clear if I were Prime Minister, I would not adopt such a policy. Mr. Clark? The problem that I think that uh, you're, not, you're not facing, as I understand your position, and I can certainly sympathize with your position, is what does a nation do if suddenly on a Tuesday night there is some uh, extraordinary, unanticipated threat to the nation's security? Uh, do we convene Parliament back and have an emergency session that, uh, that will stop that, uh, that emergency, whatever, whatever it is, from happening? Uh, the problem is that Mr. in the Clark, real world... excuse me, there is right. within the law, and I'm not a lawyer, that, but I know this, if there are reasonable and probable grounds for believing an illegal act, uh, whether it's violence from another state or internal violence is going to occur, 
within the framework of law that we now have, that's authorized. Uh, the police can take action, a politician can take action, but that is still within the framework of law. But the problem we face, Mr. Broadbent, is that uh, this, this matter, which may arise, may well not be within the, within the, the, uh, the, the normal course of, of menaces that might occur what, to a national what security. What kind of uh, oh, I, I can't I can't speculate. But I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, an expert in, uh, in questions of threats to, uh, to national security. I no, can distinguish... Sure, no, excuse me for a second. Sure, I can distinguish... Mr. Mr. Excuse me. Excuse Mr. Me. Clark, continue, sure. please. And Thank then you we'll wrap much, up this brother. question yeah. with one more comment. Uh, Two, uh, uh, there are two kinds of, of uh, threat here. One of them has to do with, with the mail opening activities. Clearly, yes. if that kind of thing which recurs is going to go on, that has to be authorized by a statute, by Parliament Act. What worries me is that we have circumstances, or we could have circumstances, where there is, where there is, is not a recurrence and where there is not time for Parliament to act quickly. And yet action has to be taken to protect the Canadian national interest. Mr. So what Clark, I want to do is establish... clearly covered by the existing law. Mr. Excuse Mr. Broadbent, excuse what me. I, what I want Mr. to Clark. do is establish very clearly a framework of law so that there will have to be authorization of any act of that kind, not by a policeman, which is unhappily the case, as the McDonald Commission seems to be indicating now, but instead by a minister who has to re report back to the highest court in the land, to Parliament, through a committee, perhaps... Uh, meeting through an oversight committee, a committee to which your party and mine and Mr. Trudeau's would all have the right to, to name members. Uh, I would certainly expect that in all cases those would be members who would be, uh, who would be preoccupied with the question of civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, that is a way of ensuring that this kind of act, if it should happen to occur, uh, allows the nation protection against that kind of act and also allows uh, some framework of law within which it occurs. I think well, that's the only realistic can, action we can take. If I can now comment on that, Mr. Clark, it seems to me that you've simply reversed the position that you took originally, which was that under certain circumstances, a politician, a senior minister of the Crown, could authorize the breaking of the law. What you're now saying is something quite different from that, which is that you would provide a new framework of law from within which you could deal with security matters. Now, when, when this matter, uh, when the RCMP debates first occurred two years ago, I proposed precisely that kind of practice, which occurs in the United Kingdom, as you probably know, that involves leaders, in some cases, of all the political parties. But surely that's quite different. You are now saying that should be done from within the framework of law, which is what different from what you said about three weeks ago, For which was I'm that a cabinet minister could authorize the breaking of a law. The positions are quite different. What I'm saying uh, now, Mr. Broadbent, is what I have said uh, consistently. Uh, and, uh, I'm afraid not. Well, thank, you, was, thank you so much, gentlemen. I, I, was, I, think I was there, have, Mr. Broadbent. We have your positions clearly yeah. on that question. And Bruce Phillips, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnston. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to raise a subject which has erupted almost since the beginning of this campaign and which is very quickly becoming an issue of major public concern, and that's nuclear power. Uh, since the Harrisburg accident, we've had some evidence coming to light that nuclear power plants are not particularly safe or that they do leave something to be desired. And I would like to ask both of you gentlemen to state a policy of whether you would be willing to arrest the construction of any further nuclear plants, or at least so far as federal jurisdiction affects this matter, uh, or whether you're prepared to let the situation go on as it is. I would be happy to do so, Mr. Phillips. Uh, in fact, uh, some two years ago, uh, through a scientific friend of mine in California who happened to be an expert in the field. He tipped me off to the fact that there were some very real difficulties in terms of safety with further expansion of nuclear facilities for energy purposes, at, at which point I consulted my colleagues, uh, Mr. Tommy Douglas uh, and Cyril Symes in our energy committee. They did some work, and to shorten the whole story, two years ago we called for a moratorium on the further expansion of nuclear energy facilities in Canada pending an inquiry by a royal commission made up of Canadian scientists who, in fact, are amongst the leading experts in the world in this area. So quite ahead of uh, the American potential disaster, our party uh, was clearly on the record as calling for uh, a moratorium till we really investigate the implications of expansion further in this field. My answer can be quite brief, Mr. Phillips. Uh, we prefer parliamentary inquiries to royal commissions. Uh, we've been calling for some time now. Uh, as recently, I think, as four days before the House rose, Flora MacDonald put the question again in the House uh, for an opportunity for a full uh, committee of Parliament to look into all of the aspects uh, related to, uh, uh, to nuclear power. We would not, however, uh, order or declare or urge a moratorium during the, uh, the hearings of this committee. Uh, we do think that it's important that there be a full and uh, fair uh, inquiry of the length and breadth of the country, but we would not uh, stop 
uh, projects that are now underway from proceeding during that inquiry. Well, Mr. Mr. Clark, could I ask you mm-hmm. if you think it's serious enough in terms of its implications, and there certainly are many other countries in the world are, that are moving towards, towards moratorium, uh, if you think it's serious enough to have an inquiry, why don't you follow the logic of this right through and say, let's not have any further expansion till at least you have a report from your parliamentary committee or... I say a royal commission composed of scientists would make more sense for me to to investigate such a, an important matter. But isn't it again trying to have it both ways? You're sort of saying, yes, let's investigate it, but at the same time, let's continue with uh, the same kind of development that may, may involve a potential disaster. Why not call a, for a moratorium? Because we don't have the evidence yet. And what I would do is... Well, is Harrisburg that, provided the evidence for a lot of people. As you know, Mr. Rodman, I'm sure Harrisburg was a, an entirely different system from the kind that, uh, that we have operating here. But to come to your question very, very directly, we would prefer to delay the decision until we had the facts in hand. We think it makes sense to find the facts before you act on them. Well, there are a lot of facts in hand. Uh, that's why a number of scientists here in Canada, in the United States, in Sweden, in West Germany, and of course appropriately in Japan, have been saying that the facts are available for at least a suspension of further expansion. Now, if it's serious enough and we almost wiped out uh, one or more states in the United States with this happening, um, anyway, I'll leave the point. It seems to me we should have a moratorium. Thank you, gentlemen. Next question, Mr. Halton, please. To put the debate on another tack, I'd like to ask Mr. Broadbent what his conditions would be for supporting a Tory minority government, indeed whether Mr. Clark would cooperate with the NDP. I find that a very bizarre question, uh, Mr. Hall. I, I think you should have asked uh, Mr. Clark what his conditions might be for supporting an NDP minority government. <laughs> and uh, see, I don't, I don't want to be facetious on the point, but uh, I was, well, it wasn't quite a year ago now, uh, down in uh, Newfoundland, uh, in Corner Brook, and a journalist... Uh, much like yourself, said to me, Mr. Broadbent, what are you doing in Cornerbrook fighting in a by-election? You only got 4.5% of the vote uh, in the 1974 election in this seat. Um, Aren't you wasting your time? Uh, And I said, no, I'm not, because we are talking about the issues that seem to me concern Canadians in a really direct way, and we have a good chance of winning. And we won the seat. Now, by extrapolation, all I'm saying is that I am running, like Mr. Clark and Mr. Trudeau, to become Prime Minister of Canada. We have a very serious program that we're offering about prices, about jobs, about uh, resource control, and that's our objective. I'm not, minority government's not on the ballot. Mr. Broadbent, I must say that if you're, uh, if you're trying not to be facetious, that's, that's a bad way to start. But in any event... Well, uh, incidentally, it was a, a conservative seat we won in Newfoundland, Mr. Clark. Well, we'll, 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 we'll win it back then, Mr. Broadbent, just to... Just to that, and, that and several others. Yes. But the point is, if, if there is a minority government, and I, I very much hope there won't be, I very much hope that... So uh, do I. ...that we will be given the opportunity to, to uh, form a majority government. If there, if there is a minority... Uh, I intend to govern entirely on the, on the program that the Progressive Conservative Party has put forward, not on somebody else's program. Uh, we will be governing as though we have a majority, although it would be far easier, naturally, far more effective for the system, I believe, if we had the, cert- the certainty of there being four years in office uh, for a government, which, uh, government to plan. And I must say, in this context, that uh, I think this whole matter has been, has been put into a, into a new light by the statement of the Prime Minister not long ago, that uh, even if my party came back with more seats than his did in a minority situation, uh, he would be inclined, uh, under certain circumstances, to cling to office. I think that that makes it imperative that all Canadians who uh, want a change should come to their own judgment as to whether or not it's Mr. Broadbent's party or my own uh, that can deliver that majority government that will uh, give Canadians the change they want. Thank you, gentlemen. Next question, Mr. Deborah, please. Mr. Johnson, I, I don't think we've heard the end of the discussion of minority government, bizarre as it might be uh, at the moment. Mr. Clark, on the question of Quebec's right to democratically self-determine its own future, you have said that you would not recognize this right. Mr. Broadbent has said that the implication of that is it would have to be violently suppressed. So the two of you are in the studio now. Let's thrash it out. Well, I think that... Uh Mr. I heard Mr. Broadbent's uh, response to that. I was frankly a little surprised by it. I thought it was a very extreme response. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, that I do not recognize the right of any one province acting unilaterally to end or to end the union or to dismember the country. Uh, I think that uh, there is a great deal of opportunity, particularly for a new national government that can establish its bona fides uh, regarding the aspirations of Quebecers within Canada a great deal of opportunity for such a new government to uh, persuade Quebecers that they will be better off to find their future, to expand as, as a community within the context of a large country. 
So I think that we are not at all faced with the, uh, with the likelihood that the only response, which I take to be Mr. Mr. Broadbent's analysis, the only response to a position such as I've taken is going to be one of violence. I've made it very clear, as I think the three Federalists, who are leaders of Federalist parties uh, here, have, that uh, none of us would contemplate the use of force. My view is that you can't keep a nation together by the force of arms, but that you can keep it together by the force of argument, uh, particularly if there are some fresh players, some fresh faces, some fresh issues. Uh, in the argument that a, that a new national conservative government, at least, would be able to put forward. Well, if I may comment, Mr. Mm -hmm. Clark, it seems to me you're skating once again, because as I read the, the, the quote, it was not dealing with a, a juridical right, uh, a legal right is established in the Constitution. If, if it were simply that matter, then I would be in agreement. If we're just trying to describe legal reality, then, then what you're saying is perfectly true, but if I may say so, not very politically relevant to what's going on in the real world. No, no province in Canada has that constitutional right uh, to secede. Uh, but as I say, that, that has little to do with the real world. What we are confronted with at this point in our history is the most serious threat to the breakup of the Union, I think, in the, in the history. And what was put to you as a question was if uh, a very substantial majority indicated in a a clear and unequivocal referendum, not the kind Mr. Levesque proposes, which I oppose and, and you and Mr. Trudeau propose, but in an unequivocally clear statement, are you in favor of independence or not, you indicated you would not accept that uh, decision. Now, my view in that is that that is not only um, offensive, because it seems to me to say to a lot of Quebecers, uh, Canadians that we admire, only one thing. It says to them, you don't have the right to make that fundamental decision, and if you don't, that does entail the only other means, and I wasn't trying to be inflammatory, is that you have to do it outside the legal process. Now, I think it's counterproductive. I think what your position is doing is building up support for the Parti Québécois because of the Québécois that people in that province are proud, and we are not going to keep them in Canada by threats. So my position is very clear on that issue, and my party, and if I understand the Prime Minister, exactly the same. Under no circumstances should force be used to keep Canada together. We are not going to create another Ireland in our land, killing each other. And if there is a clear question, and that's where at some point a federal referendum may well be required, if there is a clear question, and I don't for a moment expect that if the question is clear, Quebecers will decide for independence, but if it is, we would have to respect it and have the toughest negotiations in the history of the country. Mr. But Broadway. for you to argue the other way, it seems to me, is you're promoting the separatist forces because you are implicitly threatening violence. I didn't expect you to be accusing me of promoting separatism, but I suppose that's... Well, that's, 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 no, but uh, I think that's, that's the implication the sort of, game. of your no, argument. No, I think it isn't the implication. You've, you've conceded that the position I've taken is a, is a position that is well grounded in law. And the policy that my government but follows will be, will be a, law, a, a policy that is based upon the law. The next step, of course, one which I have to contemplate because we have a very uh, real likelihood of being the government that's going to have to sit down and be involved in, in uh, such uh, negotiations as are necessary with all provinces to, to uh, make the federal system work. Uh, the other uh, dimension, the next step that is important to, for me to consider is the acts that we can take as a new national government working with the cooperation of the other provinces to persuade Quebecers that they are better off staying within a large country. Of course, we all want that. Next question. Mr. Phillips, please. Yes, I'd like to direct a question to you, Mr. Broadbent, and although I know you speak in terms of a majority government, we can all read the polls, and we all think uh, have, I think, a fairly realistic evaluation of what might happen. Uh, if a voter's interest were in changing the government of this country, and I put this question in a forensic sense, Prime Minister, not necessarily a personal one, um, why would a voter trust you with a vote when it's not at all clear that that vote would be used to change the government of the country. Harking back to the 1972 experience when your party uh, spent eight weeks taking the government apart and 18 more months putting it back together again. Oh, well, Mr. Phillips, when people in a democracy, whether Canada or elsewhere, vote, uh, they do, as I think I suggested at the outset, they pass judgment on the parties about what they want. Uh, now, we are campaigning, unlike uh, Mr. Clark, unlike Mr. Trudeau, for the restoration of Medicare in Canada. We are campaigning for a commission that would deal with prices when prices are going up much faster than wages and salaries. 
We are campaigning for gaining control of our resources, unlike Mr. Trudeau, unlike Mr. Clark. Now, I have my very ser serious disagreements with both Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Clark on policy, as they do. Now, when we uh, are campaigning throughout the land, they are our promises. You ask the question of trust, that's a very important consideration. When voters look at Mr. Clark or Mr. Trudeau and myself, they have to make judgments about our integrity. And when they look at me, I hope they will see a man who, who would work in a majority government, which I want to form, to implement precisely these things. I am not going to be presumptuous enough at this point to say what's going to happen on May 22nd. All the polls indicate no clear decision at all is in the cards. All I can promise the people of Canada is that I will act with integrity with a majority government that I would like to have to implement my promises. Mr. Broadbent, uh, part of the judgment that uh, electors make when they choose among the parties is a look at what has happened in the past. And what happened in the past with the New Democratic Party is that particularly in 1972, your candidates went across this country attacking the government of Mr. Trudeau. Many of, you, many of your people were elected. They got in there and they propped up the government that they had been elected to oppose. That's the record of your party. And it's natural that Canadians who saw, you, saw what you did in 1972 saw the degree to which you turned attack on me and on my colleagues are highly suspicious that what you did in 1972, you're going to do again in 1979. And in my judgment, in that case, a vote for your party uh, by people who really want legitimate change in the country is far worse than wasted well, because it's, it's a vote to keep in office the party, the, the, the Trudeau government, which, in my judgment, most Canadians want out of office. Well, we're down to fundamentals now, Mr. Clark. Uh, in, in 1972, we voted to prop up, as you put it, no government. We voted to get uh, family allowances indexed, which we got. We, we voted to get Petrocan, which we forced through in negotiations. We voted to get eight amendments in the cooperative housing program, which we got. We got certain things that were NDP policy. If we look at the record in the last few years, Mr. Clark, you have voted more with Mr. Trudeau than we have. You voted for the legislation that's destroying Medicare in Canada right now. You voted to bring your party brought in the controls program. Your, your party in the House of Commons in February voted with Mr. Trudeau in opposition to a fair prices commission. If you look at the record, Mr. Clark, You've been much more in bed with Mr. Trudeau and the Liberal Party than the NDP has. I think you'll find, uh, Mr. Broadbent, that you can find any number of ways to rationalize what you did in 1972. Well, uh, did you fact, or did you not do the, the things I is, just said? Let's I, stay, let's stay I, on the... Well, I, I like gentlemen, to talk about the facts. Gentlemen, I'm very sorry. The time has expired okay. for the first round. Thank you so very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we move now to our second round. And in this next 30 minutes, Mr. Broadbent will engage Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Clark will not be involved, <clears> but will remain on the set. And if Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Broadbent are prepared, we'll turn to Mr. Deborah for the first question. Prime Minister, we'll start out with your uh, favorite topic of the campaign. You said right at the beginning of the campaign that you intended to make national unity the main issue. And you said in a radio broadcast in Toronto that uh, people who uh, perhaps disagreed with the importance you placed on this issue were guilty of treason. By that definition, perhaps uh, Mr. Broadbent is guilty of treason. And by the polls, perhaps a growing number of Canadians are guilty of treason. The polls in indicate, at least, that you haven't been advancing with this policy. That makes it at least tenable to suppose that you have seriously misjudged Canadians in this and perhaps endangered your own party. Well, you know, your question is really not well asked. I, I didn't say they were guilty of treason. I said that it was inconceivable to me that leaders of the National Party, and Mr. Broadbent just indicated that he would agree with that thought, that at a time when Canada is threatened with breakup, by the presence in Quebec of a separatist government, it's inconceivable that we wouldn't be concerned with it. And I'm sure that Mr. Broadbent, by the way he was discussing with Mr. Clark, is very concerned with it. And he tackled Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark in the very same way I would have, because we do agree that it is a, a very serious issue, the issue of unity of Canada, that the possibility of separatism is very real, with the possibility of a vote uh, in Quebec to that effect. And we have to discuss what we're going to do about it. And indeed, I'm glad we've discussed it tonight, and I hope we will discuss it more. So my point rests. Well, I'm sure the Canadian people also share this. What is important is that unity is not just the question of Quebec. Unity is many things. It's uh, whether uh, regions that are less advantaged will be uh, favored with uh, more opportunities for growth. Unity is whether we will have in the Constitution a Bill of Rights which will permit Canadians to have equal opportunity in every part of the country, regardless of sex, color, race, or, or creed. 
Unity can be the way in which we operate our energy policy and make sure that uh, the people in the West don't have very advantageous prices compared to the people in the, in the East. These are, these are all aspects of unity. But on the constitutional aspect of it and the language aspect of it, in my case rests from the discussion that we've had tonight. It is obviously as enough important a question that uh, it has been well, subject of some tenuous debate here. Mr. Trudeau, if I may come in on that mm -hmm. point, uh, where I said uh, it was not an issue in my view was on the important constitutional grounds that uh, yourself, or Mr. Clark, mm -hmm. and myself are unequivocally federalists. However else we may differ, when the referendum comes in the province of Quebec, Whoever happens to be Prime Minister, we will be as one in defending Canada, <clears throat> and I am sure uh, we will win that battle for the referendum if we get a, a clear question from Mr. Levesque. My, my concern, and I, I welcome the opportunity to have one of our serious disagreements, my own view of Canadian history and the rise of separatism in the province of Quebec differs uh, uh, markedly from your own. And to put it bluntly, I think there the problem is, uh, as it has been generated in Quebec has been twofold in nature um, that we have not. And I put you uh, as the man who has been prime minister on the spot, and I would like you to hear your answer to this, to this accusation. I believe it deeply. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have had 11 years to develop uh, an economic policy. There have been weak sectors in the uh, Quebec economy and the <coughs> textile industry. I know Mr. Pepin wanted to really change and modernize it a few years ago. His proposal didn't get through uh, your cabinet. Uh, we have had uh, persistently high levels of unemployment in the province of Quebec. A lot of young Canadians in the province of Quebec, the main support of the Parti Québécois, have been out of work. On the one hand, therefore, is an economic dimension that I would say the <coughs> federal government has helped create. But the second is your own attitude towards nationalism. And I know you believe it seriously, but I happen to think it's seriously wrong. My view is that you've always seen nationalism as essentially a negative force. And what has happened is psychologically, you have forced, through your, your attitude, Quebecers to feel that they had to choose between being Quebecois on the one hand or Canadian on the other. And if I may say so, uh, Bob Stanfield or <coughs> David Lewis, uh, my predecessors and myself, have accepted a different view of nationalism. And we've, we've been much more positive in saying to Quebecers, you can be both. You can have a sense of pride and legitimacy about your nationalism, but join with us and create a more exciting Canada, and let's all be nationalists. Let's have a Canadian nationalism uh, uh, that joins together the two great societies. But I think it's been your view, which I don't question the integrity of, and I want to make that clear, but I think a serious misjudgment that has helped create tensions in the province of Quebec that if your view, view had been different would not exist at least to the same degree now. Well, that's a strange judgment, both on the economic and on the political side, and uh, it certainly doesn't appear to be the judgment of the people of Quebec, who support not only my concept of federalism, but who support the party that stands for it. And I don't think your party, with respect, has ever managed, even when it tended to espouse special status and things, and things like that, that it made much inroads in Quebec. But let's take your two points, economic and political. On the economic side, it seems to me you chose the wrong examples. Uh, Mr. Pippin did get his policies through, and they have been constantly improved. And the fact is that today, textiles in Quebec, and indeed in Ontario, are working at 100% of capacity. And so is the clothing industry. And so is the forest industry in Quebec. So it's not, it's not as though we'd done something not to permit them to have jobs there. Our policies have worked, not only in helping them retool and becoming more skilled in textiles and clothing and footwear... Uh, in forest industries, but we've also opened markets for them. We've just finished the uh, negotiations in Geneva, which will get better access for our manufactured goods to the United States, to Europe, to Japan. So I don't think your, your economic accusation has uh, very much validity, Mr. Broadbent. Uh, otherwise, you know, there are other parts of Canada that have even higher unemployment than Quebec, and uh, they don't ask for separation. I hear more separatism in some small groups in the West who are rather wealthy. Uh, than, than in other parts of Canada. Now, insofar as your, your definition of, of nationalism, it seems to me, first you say we should respect Quebec nationalism and then say, but they should espouse Canadian nationalism. Well, 
apart from playing on words, surely that's, that's what we've been saying in Quebec. You know, the whole country is yours. It belongs to all Canadians. And don't hive yourself off in one province. Consider the national government in Ottawa as your government. And in order that they shall consider the national government as their government, we've passed the language legislation, we've, we've brought French Canadians to Ottawa, we've put them in positions of power when they were capable of exercising them, and they've, they've related to Ottawa, and that's why they vote for us. You know, it's not nationalism that I've, that I've fought, but to quote myself exactly, what I say is that it's the idea that the nation must necessarily be sovereign and independent. Okay, French Canadians, if you want to if we want to define ourselves as a nation, fine. But there's the Dini nation, there's the Inuit nation, and I'm sure there's other people in Canada who want to define themselves as nation. So these, these notions are acceptable to me as sociological nations, notions. But when you say that the nation must be sovereign and independent, then I will fight it. Right. That, and that means that I'm against separatism, can, and I know you are too. We can have the serious discussion on the point then, and I, I welcome the opportunity. Uh, you're right that those men and women still employed in the textile industry are doing well now. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mr. Pepin, I know, uh, would disagree with you that his whole policy was implicated, was Im uh, enforced by your government, and second, well... Well, well Ed, he was in my cabinet, well, I know. Well, furthermore, there, he you said, know that the percentage in the labor force in textiles in Quebec right now, compared to what it was ten years ago, has dropped radically. So, yes. there, so that, there have been a lot, and you also know that there are more than 300,000 Quebecers Unemployed, so I would still make the economics argument, but I come back to the nationalist thing because it's not just it's not just uh, wanting them to remain within the United Canada. We both want that, but it is saying to them that they can have a great attachment uh, to their own land and encourage it. Let me let me carry it over to English Canada. What's really disturbed me during your period as prime as prime minister was the failure to create in English Canada the equivalent at the national level of the kind of exuberance uh, that has gone on in Quebec. And that deals directly with the problem of foreign ownership. You promised in 1974 that in the resource sector, uh, a liberal government would have all future development projects 50 to 60 percent Canadian owned. That hasn't happened. Under FIRA, 96 percent of all of those projects with foreign capital have been approved. Now, our view is we need a heightened sense of Canadian nationalism, that we should be controlling our own resources, that we should be transforming them into manufactured goods here in this country. And if we did more of that, and we said to, for example, what, what Alan Blakeney has done in Saskatchewan with, uh, with, with Potash, we welcome, as a party, uh, René Levesque doing with asbestos. But we turn, I turn the argument around on him, and that's why I think you, the Liberal government should have been encouraging this. They should say to Ronnie Lebec, you seek, you can do that kind of nationalist thing, getting control of your own resources within the Constitution. But your government has, has discouraged, in my view, rather than encouraged, within the federal system, Canadians getting more control of their own resources. Can I have equal time? Yes, here? one uh, final comment. Uh, well, look, just a word on the textiles. Uh, yes, there are less people working in the textiles, uh, then that was essentially the essence of Mr. Pepin's and our policy. Some aspects of the textiles were better seen transferred to the Taiwans and the, and the Koreas and, 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 uh, and places where cost of labor are very, very low. Our whole policy has been to able to help the textile industry to modernize, to get into areas where you need high technology and less labor, and to help those who were of a certain age to retire in grace and to have a sufficient retirement pension. So there's no argument from the fact that there are less people in textile. The point is that they're working at 100% of capacity. But let's get to your question of foreign ownership that you slipped into. It would seem to me that uh, in this area where we've done, I think, everything that the Canadian, the Committee for an Independent Canada asked for back in 1968-69, you know, they asked for a, a, a corporation that Canadians could own. Well, we created the Canadian Development Corporation. They wanted a review agency that would look at investments and ask if they were of significant benefit to Canada, and we created that review agency. And incidentally, when you say that it approved 90 percent... 96. 96 percent of the applications, uh, the statistics are about right, but what, is, what you don't uh, understand, I believe, is that they approve them after the applications have indicated that they would 
over a period of sometimes three, five, and ten years, ensured that Canadians would be majority ownership, major, majority owners in it. Therefore, we, we accept investment in Canada. It creates jobs. It uh, creates economic expansion. But we negotiate through this, uh, this agency to say, uh, well, if you're going to come, make sure it's not, uh, uh, not without bringing new research and development or not without bringing new Canadian ownership and so on. Now, insofar as other areas are concerned, well, uh, we did create Petro Canada, not when we were a minority government, as you seem to, to be implying. We, it, it came into existence in 1975. Uh, that's when, that's when we created Petro Canada, long after we'd had a majority. Oh, yeah. uh, the point is that in the area of, of Canadian nationalism, it's not only an economic matter. I think if you look at what we've done with Canadian content rules and radio and television, what we've done in creating the Canadian Film Development Corporation, what we've done in setting up in the magazine industry rules to protect Canadian editors and publishers, I think you will realize on the contrary that we're we're working very hard to create in Canada a reinforcement to the spirit of Canadianism that is there and that has to be encouraged. And you can see that through the Canada Council. You can see it in, in many other areas. And certainly that happens to be, if I can draw Mr. Clark in perhaps later, that's one of the areas that uh, we object when he says he will give jurisdiction over communications or culture to the provinces, when he wants to abolish Lotto Canada, which is distributing something like $80 million a year to, for culture and the arts and, and, and sports. So it seems to me that you could always say more, more, more. No, but well, in all these areas, we have uh, done, I suggest, a great deal to create not only a feeling of Canadian identity in an economic sense, but uh, also in a cultural sense, which well, is extraordinary. Mr. Gentlemen, there are several, a number of other questions in which our panelists would like your views. I think we Mr. should Mr. move Moderate, now let to... Let me uh, take five seconds, because five seconds, uh, I was accused of virtually of misquoting the Prime Minister. He did use the word treasonable in Toronto. I was there, hmm. I heard it. Was it uh, qualified, uh, Peter? Almost treasonable. Well, yeah. Yes. Well, it's rung through the campaign since then, Prime Minister. It's what? It's rung through the campaign since then, and it's been... To what rung through the campaign means, but when I say almost treasonable. This isn't accusing somebody of, of committing an act of treason. But before us, this is, this is to be a genuine debate. I like to, the Prime Minister has made a number of assertions that I think are simply factually inaccurate. Uh, well, Mr. Broadbent, we may get back to them, but I well, mentioned that we have another question. I Mr. thought this Phillips, was please? to be a debate between the... All right, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm glad somebody raised the subject of unemployment a few moments ago. I really think we have to deal with that, gentlemen. I, I think the latest Canada manpower statistics show there's about one job for every 20 applicants. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, in Vancouver, I think it was, you suggested to one of your hecklers that unemployment was a condition of laziness. Do you really believe that? And at Maple Leaf Gardens, um, you, uh, you said you were proud of your economic record uh, and uh, that this economy was operating now at or near capacity. And if we have an economy operating at capacity, which still throws off nearly a million uh, unemployed people, it suggests that there's something fundamentally wrong with our economy. I'd like you to deal with that issue. What are you going to do to get uh, those 900,000 people back to work? Well, can I, can I deal with the uh, quote on the hecklers first again? I was addressing a group of people who had come to break up my meeting. And I'd seen them the night before with the same painted sign. And I didn't say unemployed or lazy. I said, you people out there who paid to break up other people's meetings, you get off your butt and, and work. And I, that's what I said. And I probably would say it again if, it, if, they, if they came to break up my meeting again. So that doesn't mean that there's no concern for unemployed. When our country has the record of job creation of any of the major industrial societies, something must be right with the economy. When our country has created over the past 10 years nearly 3 million jobs, there's something going right in the economy. And when you can see all these sec sectors operating at 100% or close to 100% of capacity, some 100, and manufacturing generally is 90. Obviously, the economy is working near capacity. Now, why is there a great, great number of unemployed? Very simple reason. In the past 10 years, the Canadian population increased about 16 to 18 percent at the same time, and it is a great concern for our government, for other governments in, in modern industrial societies. The point I'm making is that the economy 
has been dealing with this by creating jobs at a very fast rate. Now, you say, well, what? All right, but uh, baby boom and so on, why didn't you do more to create jobs? Well, the private sector, I repeat now, is working close to capacity. As far as the public sector is concerned, in this year alone, we're putting $1,600,000,000. $1,600,000,000, half of it about to create jobs directly, whether it be the job experience training program, uh, whether it be the tax incentives, the things that I understand Mr. Clark wants to abolish, or whether it be another seven or eight hundred million dollars in manpower retraining, so that the people who are excess labor now will be able to hold jobs in the in the few years from now when there are when there will be a shortage of labor and where we will need skilled Canadians to fill those jobs. You know, there's a, a, you talk about a figure of a million unemployed and so on. There's a overwhelming majority of those, I think the figures are about 90%, who are unemployed for less than three months. And that's a very significant proportion. They're unemployed for three months, they're between jobs, they're young people out of universities, they're coming onto the labor market, and we're paying employers in order to hire them. We're giving a dollar fifty an hour to employers to say, well, look, these young people don't have experience, you're looking for experienced workers, we'll pay part of their wage and, uh, and give them experience. And well, this has been working. Yes, Mr. Mr. Trudeau, I'd like to just get in on uh, a number of your assertions. Uh, you say we've created jobs at a faster rate than any other industrial country. That's not so. For example, the United, yeah. the United States in each of the past two years has had a faster job uh, creation. Well, look, I can, you can look, reply look, in a second. You can take you, one you, year you, and another year. Well, I'm the last two about years, the ten years. The last two years, the United States has created jobs at a faster rate on a percentage basis, given the relative strength of their economy, than has Canada. And other countries, when Germany, for example, have, Netherlands, uh, Sweden, have unemployment levels at only a half or a third of our unemployment level, they don't need to create the jobs. Obviously, if you don't have people coming onto the labor force, you don't have to create a lot of jobs. So they, they haven't. Now, the United States has, and they've done much better than we have in, in, in dealing with unemployment. And, and for me, it goes back to a comment you made earlier about setting up the CDC. Well, the, the reality is the Canadian Development Corporation was indeed set up to create jobs in Canada, but of the more than 20,000 jobs under their control now, over half of them are outside of Canada. And it was the CDC, your federal agency, that through uh, its control of Texas Gulf, was involved in creating a, a billion dollar copper enterprise in Panama, precisely at the time we laid off a, a, a thousand workers in the copper industry in British Columbia. Uh, FIRA, you say, uh, was and is concerned with uh, the problem of Canadian ownership. Well, Mr. Horner, in a cabinet document that I got a hold of, acknowledged uh, that the cabinet had reached a decision some time ago uh, that Canadian ownership was no longer uh, an essential requirement or high in the priorities for resource development. Now, Australia, during the same period of time as your government, roughly, uh, embarked on a, an Australian ownership policy in the resource sector, and unlike your government, achieved sort of 95 percent of Australian control in all new resource development projects in that time. Now, I think uh, that if we did that in Canada, uh, uh, we would have a lot more jobs. If you take, uh, again, a, a surely a relevant statistic, in 1950, 15% of the, the minerals were being exported in unprocessed form out of Canada. That figure has now risen to 49%. So your government hasn't been developing a sector policy that says that we should be, you know, concentrating in, on exporting uh, uh, furniture instead of lumber, concentrating on exporting petrochemical products instead of gas. That the, there has been, in short, no industrial policy. And where you have set up instruments like FIRA or the CDC, rather than implementing them, they've, they've been ignored and uh, have left, uh, been left idle. And one of the consequences of this, in my serious judgment, is that we don't have the jobs for those one million Canadians that, that, that we could have if, if your own government had been more consistent and determined in its economic policy. I find Gentlemen, thank you for your time on that issue. I'm anxious that we move to another question. Mr. Halton, please. Well, hold on, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, surely we can uh, give you a very short reply. You didn't give me one. Very short reply, Mr. Trudeau. Well, uh, 
just very short one, a contradiction in what he says. On the first, on the first part, Mr. Broadbent says we should process our material, furniture, and so on before we export it, that you object to the EDC, the Export Development Corporation, uh, financing an industry in, in Panama, which means that we're going to be creating here the machinery, the engineering skills, the tools, everything that's going into it. We just don't give money to Panama. We say, if you want to buy in Canada machinery and tools and materials and blueprints and skills, then we will lend you money. And that's, but unless you want to continue exporting raw materials, half of the 400,000 jobs just created in the past year come from because we have exported like that credits that people buy yeah, in Mr. Canada no, and raw materials. Wrong Gentlemen, again. I'm sorry, we're very quickly running out of time in this uh, round, well. and there are several other issues our panelists wish to explore with you. Mr. Halton, please. One of them, David, is uh, what Mr. Broadbent has campaigned uh, heavily on during this uh, election, and that is Medicare. I would like to ask Mr. Trudeau how he responds to the NDP charges that the federal government is partly responsible for a severe erosion of Medicare in this country, a liberal government that bought in Medicare, as you know, under Mr. Pearson. Well, I, I, I think that's a clear case of jumping on our bandwagon. Of course, the Liberal Party brought in Medicare. It was proclaimed by my government after Mr. Pearson had, had adopted it. He is alluding to, Mr. Broadbent is alluding to the practice that some provinces are slipping away from the practice of universal accessibility by permitting doctors to uh, double bill and so on. And this is a concern of mine. It's a concern of our Minister of Health. And the reason for that is that now, in a sense, we trust the provinces. Until now, until two years ago, we had a system where we'd check all their bills and we'd say, well, we pay 50% of your bill. But uh, after 10 years of Medicare, we said, well, provinces are asking for greater autonomy. Uh, they want to be able to administer without having Big Brother in Ottawa always look at their bills. So we said, okay, we'll trust you. We'll pay roughly half and uh, you'll pay the other half, which incidentally, I, I agree with Mr. Broadbent, they're slipping away from that. But we have, we have the tools under the law, and we say, well, and I said back when we adopted this system in 77, we will use our half and, 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 and make sure that you continue to apply the rules, otherwise we'll have to renegotiate the whole scheme. And that's been our approach to federalism. It was called opting out in Mr. Pearson's time. In our time, I said, well, I don't want just one province to opt out. I would like all provinces to give me their word that they're going to continue to practice the four principles of Medicare, and most importantly, universality and transferability and accessibility. And if they do, I will trust them. And if my trust isn't substantiated, I've made it quite clear during this campaign that we will go back to the old system of checking their accounts and saying, well, you haven't spent 50% and uh, therefore we're going to keep some of the well, money back. Mr. Trudeau, my reply to that is that, uh, again, that was a serious error in judgment on the part of your government. Two years I ago, the can, I make, the, can yes. I make the argument? Two years ago, when you introduced this legislation, we expressed concern that if you transfer to the provinces the fiscal capacity to uh, implement Medicare or not, that in fact you were gambling with Medicare. And I remember very vividly, it's in Hansard, you said you would be willing to gamble uh, that the provinces would maintain the system. Now at that time, we expressed our very serious concern that a lot of provinces would stop spending the money that you were transferring to them on medical services and that we had to maintain the existing federal law to make sure we had universal Medicare. Now at that time, we voted against it because we said there was a real danger. Now I was afraid simply that the poor provinces yes. might opt out. But in fact, it's been the big conservative provinces, Ontario and Alberta, that have been the main culprits. Now we voted against that legislation because we thought Medicare would be destroyed. Mr. Clark incidentally voted with you. Yes. I, I, I think your concern uh, with hindsight was justified. We refused to do what the provinces asked in many other areas, like the Canada Assistance Plan. We said that program isn't established enough and we, we want to continue checking the accounts. But in Medicare, in hospital insurance, and in post-secondary education, it's been around now for many years, and we'll trust you. What you're really saying is I shouldn't have trusted the provinces. Well, I, I'll, uh, I'll take another chance on that. I think that now that we've drawn to their attention the, the 
the slipping well, away from I'm, these principles. I'm, I'm sure that uh, the concern that you and I have expressed in this campaign has been brought to their attention, but more important, our Minister of, of Health and Welfare, Madame Bégin, has been not only contacting the provinces, but she's actually threatened one with holding up our part of the payment because we didn't transfer only tax points. Still, 50% of what we pay, roughly, is in cash. Well, we, we have a we commitment to reintro reintroduce the old legislation. Well, well, is that your position as well, that you would bring back the 50-50 cost-sharing No, I, I, I wouldn't bring it back immediately. I think the provinces um, should be given a chance to explain their point of view and say, look, uh, we don't want to go back to the old account checking. Uh, well, we seven of sure. them have introduced deterrent fees. 20% of the doctors in Ontario are out of OHIP. Oh. I know, but deterrent fees, uh, per se, if they don't prevent accessibility, uh, you know, depends how big and what. But well, the, they're the big for a pensioner. A five dollar well, deterrent fee is a lot for a pensioner. I agree, or an unemployed I agree. person. And that's what we're, that's what we're telling. Uh, well, you have you have deterrent fees in the sense in some provinces you pay in Ontario, you're paying a, a premium which you don't pay in other provinces. The Saskatchewan but does not have. An Indi where there's an NDP government, there is no premium at I all. Agree. I agree. It's mainly conservative governments in Ontario and Alberta and in New Brunswick, which have... Uh, well, which there are no liberal been. governments left, so they're... Well, there's there's, uh, almost out of time in this round. Could we have one more question? Mr. Deborah, please. Uh, perhaps this is a short one. A young man came up to me on the street in Vancouver the other day and said that I and the other journalists were really not paying enough attention to the question of legalizing marijuana. He said uh, this has caused uh, injustice to thousands of Canadians and it wasn't really being discussed between the leaders in the campaign. Mr. Broadman? I think for once Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Clark and myself are all in agreement. We've all taken the position as I understand it. But nothing it seems be... to happen on it. Well, well, why debate about something you're in agreement uh, on? We've, we've taken the position that it should be decriminalized, but that's it. We do, are not, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not in favor of encouraging the use of marijuana just frankly, as I'm not in favor of encouraging the use of alcohol or, or smoking. Uh, that's our position. Would you make that, uh, say, a priority demand if you held the balance of power in a minority situation? Well, if it's a matter that all the parties are in agreement, and I'm not talking about a minority government, I'm talking about forming a government, if you, you have a policy that all parties are in agreement on, of, on decriminalizing, it seems to me it's something that could be passed in a matter of uh, days, if not hours. Uh, I agree with Mr. Broadbent on this. Um, the principles are the same, and I agree with Ed's assessment of do we agree? We attempted, Mr. Alon attempted even in this last session of Parliament to see if we could get it passed in one or two days, and uh, the creditists said no. And I think, I don't know if Ed would share this view, but ours was that there was tax-cutting legislation, there was emergency energy supply legislation, there's the referendum legislation, and all these are very important pieces of legislation. For that matter, there was the uh, anti-boycott legislation. And you can't do it all, uh, and, and, and uh, the decriminalization, which is something we would like to see passed, but not the complete legalization. I think the distinction is important. It wouldn't be a crime, but it would still be an offense to possess an offense punishable by fine rather than, uh, than a jail sentence. But uh, we haven't been able to get agreement to pass Gentlemen, it soon. Gentlemen, I would regret to intervene. I fear our time for the second round is over. Thank you for that exchange. Thank you, Mr. Broadbent. Mr. Trudeau, we now move to our third round in which uh, Mr. Trudeau will engage with Mr. Clark for the next 30 minutes. Mr. Broadbent will not participate, but will remain on the set. And I believe the question is yours, Mr. Phillips, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, gentlemen, uh, if our antenna are at all accurate about this election, the impression that I gather and other people gather is that the public has very serious reservations about both of you. And uh, you have both uh, used an extraordinary amount of time in this election campaign having at uh, the other fellow. Uh, you, Mr. Trudeau, have accused uh, Mr. Clark of being a messenger boy for the provinces and... Uh, You've accused Mr. Trudeau of being arrogant. Uh, now that we've got the two of you here face to face, I would like you, uh, Mr. Trudeau, to explain to me just why you think Joe Clark is weak and vacillating and, uh, and uh, why, uh, Mr. Clark, you think you're, you're not weak and vacillating, that you are, in fact, uh, reasonable, and, uh, and why you think Mr. Clark, Mr. Trudeau is so dictatorial. In other words, I would like you to discuss the leadership issue and your capacity to lead as contrasted with the other candidates. 
Mr. Uh, Trudeau. If you're talking, t- starting with me, Bruce, uh, the examples I've gave, I've given uh, of Mr. Clark's vacillations uh, have been illustrated here tonight in the first part of the, part of the discussion. When uh, he said at one point, Mr. Clark said at one point that uh, uh, he would uh, have a stimulative deficit for perhaps three years, uh, and then he said at another that he was against a stimulative deficit because he knew that it would, uh, it would cause greater inflation. Uh, another example of that is what was discussed again in the first part of this debate on Quebec separation. Mr. Clark said in, uh, in October that if Quebecers voted 60% uh, in a referendum on sovereign dissociation and the question was reasonably clear, he would sit down and negotiate. And by December, he was saying he wouldn't negotiate, he'd just talk. And by January, he said he wouldn't do either. And by March, he was saying he wouldn't even sit down and talk if they voted clearly to get out of Canada in a clear vote. Um, Examples on Petro-Canada. I think Mr. Broadbent's questioning of him illustrated that on Petro-Canada they have changed their position. So it's, it's this changing of position. Israel is another good example. In January, you wouldn't move your uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. In April, you would. Uh, it's not only this changing of position, but it's a willingness to say to the provinces that whatever they're asking for um, is all right. I see, as I indicated earlier, I see no reason why the provinces uh, should be right when they say that we should get out of Petro-Canada or that we should get out of Lotto-Canada, which I repeat serves to to encourage uh, amateur sports and uh, and culture. I see no reason why, just because a province says that it wants to have jurisdiction over fisheries, when the Fathers of Confederation said 110 years ago that it was a federal jurisdiction, uh, why suddenly the federal government should realize that uh, it should go to the provinces. And in all these areas, I think Mr. Clark is trying to please a lot of people. When he makes, what is it, $7 billion worth of promises, uh, Mr. Leader of the no, Opposition? No, not, not by any realistic no. count, but by yours. Well, by how much, how much is it? Uh, Trotto, we, we one of the rare back, things in which the Toronto Star and I are in agreement on, we think it's in the neighborhood of uh, $3 billion. Your Minister of Finance, who... I've always thought had a little difficulty counting, uh, has it much higher than that. He has it around $7 billion, but I'd like to know what you're, what you're cutting out uh, if it's only $3 billion. It's already two a tax cut. Then uh, when your mortgage plan is implemented, it's going to be, a, your own figures, a, a billion six plus another $700 million to the provinces. We've already exceeded your figure. And are you going to cut the sales tax on construction materials or not? Uh, some of your candidates say yes, some of them say no, but you promised they would cut it. So you're way into the already $4 billion just out of, just out of memory. Uh, there's also the, the $5,000 uh, tax credit to small businesses. Uh, that's another billion dollars. I don't know which of these promises you're still sticking with, but I think the point is the one I'm trying to make, that you, you want to please a lot of people, which is a laudable uh, attitude for a politician, but you're making promises all over the lot without, and saying you, you have no magic accountant, you don't know how much it's going to cost. I suppose the people will figure that out later. But in all these examples, you seem to be changing your mind all the time. If there's a bit of pressure, you change your position. And if the provinces want the feds to get out of some area of jurisdiction, like the most perhaps serious example is the one of resources. When Premier Lougheed was in the city in February, he wanted to limit, as you know, the trade and commerce power so that we wouldn't be able to, in normal circumstances, set one price of oil across Canada. And you went out to Alberta and you said you agreed with Premier Lougheed's position on resources. Now, all these are very serious weakenings of the federal government's power to govern for all of Canada, whether it be in fisheries or in resources or in trade and commerce. And I think they're also depriving the federal government in the area of culture and communications of one of the very most important instruments, and Ed and I were talking about it earlier, in terms of making sure there is a Canadian identity. Because if you give communications to each province, it'll end up like each province which has jurisdiction now over education. 
only their system of education works. Sometimes they don't even recognize certificates from other provinces for teaching, and they recognize them from Europe. And I think that's a very serious approach to, uh, to constitutional reform. Mr. Clark, would you like to comment mm -hmm. then to Mr. Uh, Trudeau's questions and, and to Mr. Phillips' original question, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I was afraid I might go through this half hour without a chance to, uh, to raise my voice. Of course, I'd, I'd never do that in anger. That's a very interesting argument you're putting forward uh, in everything except, uh, except the facts. It doesn't accord with the facts. I don't blame you for putting it forward. Uh, you're obviously trying to uh, divert attention from uh, a record which has, by and large, been a record of failure in 11 years of government. And if you can find some, uh, some target in, uh, in things I've been saying, uh, naturally, you're going to go at it. I must say that I find it uh, ironic that I should be accused of electoral inconsistency by a man who in 1974 went into an election campaign saying that you would never bring in controls and then a year later turned around and brought in the program that you said you wouldn't bring in. I won't go through the, the whole uh, long list of things in which you're wrong. I'll, I'll deal with a couple of them, though, if I might. Uh, perhaps Lotto Canada is as interesting as anything else. Uh, what we are suggesting that you should do, that the government of Canada should do, in regard to Lotto Canada, is do what it promised to do. Because when Lotto Canada was established, it was established for a very limited purpose. There were undertakings given, given on the floor of the House of Commons that its purpose would be limited to retiring federal portion of the Olympic debt. Then, without any permission from, from uh, Parliament, and indeed, in the absence of any agreement with the provinces, you expanded the role of Lotto Canada. You're now, tonight, <laughs> claiming credit for Lotto Canada as an instrument of cultural policy. Uh, that was added very recently, no doubt, as a means to try to make uh, Lotto Canada appear to be a far more attractive instrument than it had been in the past. I could go through the, the, uh, the other list of so-called inconsistencies. Do. Well, no, there are other matters I want to turn to. I'll deal with one, Israel. Uh, you, you pointed out that uh, in, uh, in January I made the case that I wouldn't want to take an action that would jeopardize the negotiations that were then going on between uh, uh, Israel and Egypt. And in April, I said that Canada would move. Uh, our embassy under my government to the western part of Jerusalem. Something rather significant happened in the interim. The peace accord was, uh, peace accord was signed. The condition that I had set as being something I wouldn't want to interfere with was no longer there. And I happen to believe that there are times when a, a nation like Canada that uh, believes in the, in the uh, right to exist of the state of Israel, believes in that as a matter of principle, has to act to back up what it uh, says it believes in. But let me come back, if I might, to the the other half of your question, which had to do with, with why I accuse Mr. Trudeau of, uh, of acting in a dictatorial way. Again, I could find a long list of things, but we've, we've spent a lot of time this evening on long lists. I'll deal simply with Parliament. Uh, I happen to believe that Parliament is the core of our political system here, that it has to have power in, in our system if we are going to remain a representative body, uh, if we're going to re retain any legitimacy to the way that it, decisions are taken and accepted by the people of Canada. I think that if there has been one fundamental political disease in the last 11 years, it is the sense that the government is going one way and the people are going another way, that there is, an, there is government by an isolated elite. That has been aggravated very materially by the weakening in the power of Parliament. One of the first things, the action, the, one of the first actions of Mr. Trudeau's government uh, when in, in early, I think, 1969, was to substantially change the power of Parliament to control spending. It used to be that there was debate of estimates without any limitation on time. Now uh, we have a farcical situation where it is literally impossible for the opposition in a majority parliament to stop spending. Now I intend to uh, return to the House of Commons the power to control spending. I intend to open wide the latitude open to parliamentary committees because I don't think that any one man's view, even if that person is prime minister, should be in a position to veto the views of others. And unfortunately, uh, the limitations that now exist upon the committee system, uh, the fate of private members' bills that don't happen to agree with the point of view of a party leader, both indicate that Parliament is a much less effective instrument, instrument of democracy, than it should be. I don't think that happened by accident. I think that happened because it was more convenient to govern that way. And uh, that's one, of, one instance I will cite of, uh, of, of several in which over the last 11 years there has been an appropriation of power to Ottawa, to the Office of Prime Minister, that in my judgment should not be there. Can I uh, add a few reply, words? Mr. Trudeau? Uh, on Israel, I think the leader of the opposition indicates that indeed his knowledge of the situation is probably limited because it's not only Egypt which is concerned with the future of Jerusalem, Egypt and Israel. Jordan is concerned, Saudi Arabia is concerned, Israel is concerned, Lebanon is concerned, indeed all the Arab states if you want them to have peace with Israel, and not only Egypt to have peace with Israel, you can't 
intervene and say, well, we've just signed a peace with one of them, we're going to forget about you, and we'll make a unilateral move in support of one side. I just think that is completely irresponsible. On Lotto Canada, we didn't do that without authorization of Parliament. We went back to Parliament and we said we will prolong Lotto Canada, and what's more, we negotiated an agreement. Mrs. Iona Campanola negotiated an agreement to which all the provinces agreed, that we would have Lotto's lotteries above $10, they'd have below $10. This was an agreement. You stepped in and said, well, we'll give it all to the provinces. You did the same thing with fisheries because we had negotiated an agreement with the three maritime provinces that we wouldn't discuss uh, the, air, the question of ownership of the offshore. We would just see that it would be administered for the good of all. And then you said, well, we'll give it to the provinces. But getting back to Parliament, um, you know, when you talk of the committee system, Mr. Clark, the committee system was set up, as you well know, in order to permit smaller groups of members of all parties to examine the estimates in greater depth. It used to be that we would, in full Parliament, examine the whole thing, and naturally you can't go through a blue book, which is thousands of pages, the estimates, thousands of pages, uh, in Parliament all the time if you also have to legislate whether it be the items we were talking about any other. So we set up committee systems so that the committees could specialize and, and become committees on justice or committees which would examine the estimates of the Department of Trade and Commerce and have the officials and have the ministers there so that they could examine them, which they do. But, of course, it all has to end every year, and that's why there's a cutoff system. But the opposition parties have, what is it, 28 or 27 Debates, days when they can when they can vote no confidence in the government, when they can debate their own subjects on the estimates in the House of Commons. But the committees meet for dozens and dozens and hundreds of days if they want. So we haven't weakened it. And insofar as weakening Parliament, you know, our government was the first one to to give funds to the caucuses of the various parties so that they could research, so that their members could do their jobs better. Our party has doubled and tripled the numbers of secretaries available for each member so he could do his work. Our party has expanded the, the premises. We think it's very important that the member of parliament be given the tools to do the job for a very simple reason, is that we're a large country, the members of parliament are working in Ottawa 300 days a year, and they're not present in their various constituencies, they have to have the tools to show the federal presence there. You've and that's why we've done all these you've things. Talked about Mr. Clark, the a final brief comment. Thank you. You've talked about the theory of why the committees were changed. I know something about them from practice, because I had the opportunity of serving on them as a private member before I became the, the leader of my party, and they don't work that way. And one of the reasons they don't work that way is because while perhaps in theory they could be given unlimited time to look into these matters. Your government doesn't give them that kind of time. We're and not indeed, master of the time they have. They make themselves, that. Mr. Clark. That is, that's, I think we both know better than that, uh, Mr. Trudeau. We do but know the, better than that. Yes, Therefore, you shouldn't say the contrary. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stating the case uh, as I know it, and as I think most members of Parliament know it to be the case. The fact is that we now have a system in which the, the ability to influence events in Parliament is limited to a very small number of people who happen to be in Cabinet. That's a tremendous wastage of potential. And uh, what we have to do is uh, look at reforms, partly which will restore the ability to control spending. And I think that no objective judge of the, the pre-69 and the post-69 control of spending would, would argue that there is more control now than before. Indeed, I think uh, the Audit Auditors General and the, and the Lambert Commission have both indicated that accountability has weakened rather than strengthened over, over recent years. But I want to be brief here. Uh, I think that the attitude you've taken towards Parliament, you and your government, has been one that has seriously downgraded an institution which should be at the center of our nation. And certainly one of the changes that uh, Canadians will achieve if, uh, if we're fortunate enough to be elected the 22nd of May is that there will be a fundamental change in the approach to Parliament. Now, you raised other matters uh, about fisheries. I'm not going to give fisheries jurisdiction to the provinces. What I'm going to say, what I'm going to do with the provinces is say that instead of having Romeo Leblanc go down there as minister, uh, and fight with every minister in sight. He even fought with the liberal ministers when there used to be some in the provinces. We are going to work cooperatively with the provinces, recognizing that the impact of fishery policy on Newfoundland, on Nova Scotia, uh, on Prince Edward Island is immense on British Columbia, and that, that they cannot be treated as, as solitudes, as your government has uh, far too often been treating them. And gentlemen, you've well, each I'm had two opportunities to deal with that issue. The next question from Mr. Halton, please. 
Well, Mr. Clark has just raised the uh, question of the Lambert Royal Commission, which uh, implied that your government has lost control of public spending. Is there any reason to expect that the public purse would be better protected if you're re-elected? We set up the Lambert Commission. We set it up because very serious questions were raised by myself, by other parliamentarians, about the possibility of our traditional way of controlling not only public expenditure, but public controlling the, the departments themselves, which had grown from uh, traditionally small numbers of 500 or 1,000 people to as many as 50 and 25,000 people. And the whole, the whole theory of um, ministerial responsibility as being responsible for everything that happens down this department, whether it be financial control or indeed some, some uh, unqualified person doing the wrong thing, was changed. And uh, though we've had opposition parties, I think mainly Mr. Clark saying, and the minister has to stand for everything that's done in his department. We say, I mean, this is the traditional parliament system. But a minister doesn't hire his officials. He can't possibly check all their accounts. And we're setting up you, Mr. Lambert, and your colleagues to tell us how tighter control can be set in. We had done that with the office of the Auditor General. And we created, not only passed a new act, but we also in Parliament set up the Office of Controller General to help the Auditor General. So when I, when I came into, into office as Prime Minister, I, was, I realized that governments had grown bigger and that the instruments of control were not as tight as they, as they could be. Uh, there had been a lot of decentralization as a result of the, the Glasgow Commission. And at that time, in the early 60s, it was seen as the right thing. Give more power to each department so it can administer itself. Well, that was a, a good reform, and it was implemented, began by Mr. Pearson and continued by me. But the result is that all this decentralization meant a, lo a loss of control. And that's why we set up the Controller General. That's why we set up the Lambert Commission to examine these problems and to make the recommendations. And we will listen to these recommendations when they can be applied, just as we listen to the recommendations of the Auditor General. When he studied it and he said, well, I can't do it alone, I need a Controller General who will be in with the Treasury Board. And so we, we're, we're trying to improve the parliamentary systems. The answer to your question is very simple. Yes. Uh, if we form the next government, we will look at the recommendations of the Lambert Commission and see in what ways it can be improved, as we did with the Auditor General. Mr. Trudeau, with, with, with all respect, uh, you set up the Lambert Commission, which I agree you did, but you did that because the Auditor General had made criticisms of, uh, of the, the accountability and the system of control in your government that you were not prepared to deal with. So you put the question aside by establishing a royal commission. And now, now what you've done with that Royal Commission is have its recommendations studied by a task force of public servants, uh, presumably the people who are at the very heart of, of what's being criticized. Uh, there are some very specific, concrete recommendations there. I don't know what, what your attitude toward them would be. I can certainly tell you what mine would be, because I think that there is, uh, there is a totally inadequate control of public spending now. First of all, I would go back to give to the whole Parliament the capacity to consider some estimates without any time limitation. That's the power that was taken away by your government back in 69, I believe the year was. Without and any time limitation? Without any... Well, what that we would could do, go on for what? Well, uh, what, how many months? That could go on for a long time. What I would do is limit it to two departments, and I would let you or whoever's the leader of the opposition after the, after the 22nd designate those two departments and designate them after the, the estimates of all had been prepared so that every department would prepare its estimates knowing that it might be subject to penny-by-penny penny scrutiny. But what happens now with a time limit is that your fellows get up and talk, talk out the time limit without allowing the people who are there to scrutinize uh, the government and not to defend it, without allowing us the latitude to carry out the kind of examination that used to be there before the, the rules were changed. That's one thing we'd do. We'd also introduce the, into this, into Canadian practice, the sunset law so that we'd get some hold on uh, crown corporations and crown agencies that uh, have been there a long time and perhaps no longer need to exist or indeed perhaps no longer need to carry out some of the functions that they're carrying out now. We'd extend substantially the concept of zero-based budgeting. We'd accept the recommendation of the, uh, of the Lambert Commission regarding staff for parliamentary committees so that they can, with effect, look into some of the spending that's going on. Those are some of the specific recommendations that, uh, that have come down that I think are essential to having accountability. And I guess the, the granddaddy of them all, the most important of them, would be a freedom of information law that really meant something. I, I frankly don't understand why there has been such reluctance on your part 
to having a freedom of information law that, that would have exemptions uh, so narrowly limited that people can't drive trucks through them. Uh, I, if, I were, if I were in your situation, I would want to know what was going on in my government. And I think the only way you can guarantee you know is if everybody knows. And that seems to me to be the, the simple logic of the kind of freedom of information law that Mr. Baldwin has proposed and that uh, we've adopted and the Canadian Bar Association has proposed. The exemptions we have, Mr. Clark, are the same that are applied in the United States and Sweden and other countries that have freedom of information laws. It's that we're not compelled to give information in cases where it would hurt the privacy of an individual or relations between states and so on. So you don't drive a truck to them, you just respect the conventions of a civilized society, and that's the basis of our law. But, Mr. Chairman, I sense these people closing in here. Uh, are we going to be able to talk about energy? Are we going to be able to talk, Mr. So. Clark and I? I we have less than to, 10 minutes left to talk about energy. Let's turn to the question for and Mr. Deborah, Clark please. has never been able to, to indicate... Uh, that there would be one price for energy across Canada. And it we, seems to me that's a very important... So I think we'll aspect. get to that uh, we? perhaps in the next well, that, question. That, Mr. That, Dubbo, that certainly please. would be the position we'd be following. Not immediately, uh, Mr. Johnson. I'd like to talk uh, just for a moment uh, about the Constitution. The Prime Minister at least has <coughs> unveiled plans to change the Constitution and to bring the Constitution home to Canada, even if everyone hasn't agreed with them. It seems to me, Mr. Clark, that, uh, that your plan for constitutional reform seem to, seems to be based on some sort of pious hope somehow that you can talk to the premiers and that uh, um, you want to further decentralize a country which is already one of the most decentralized countries in the world. Well, let me deal with it. The Prime Minister has uh, outlined a proposal to bring it back unilaterally. Not only uh, you say that not everyone agrees with him, I don't know of anyone outside... Premier Davis. His immediate, no, Premier Davis proposed something quite different, as I think what you well know. What did he propose, know. Mr. Clark? What, what Premier Davis proposed was that there should be agreement among the provinces around the table for the kind of action that you... He did you not. Indeed he, he did. He said Indeed if he there's did. no agreement reached, <laughs> I think it should be done unilaterally. I think if there's no agreement amongst the provinces as to the amending formula, here in February, and I'm sure these gentlemen are watching on television, they're perhaps there, he said, I think it's a shame that we've wait, waited this long. I think the federal government should take the initiative to bring it back, and he was supported by several other premiers. So, our, our, so I would say, say nobody I would say Mr. Cowett said this in 1976, well, incidentally. I, I see you're driven to citing Mr. Cowett. I, uh, uh, I, and, and I suppose that's because it would be more difficult to cite either Mr. Waugh or Mr. Ryan, uh, the leader of the party bearing your name in the province of Quebec, who has disagreed so profoundly with, with the position you've taken. Uh, yes. Our, our recollection. So I'm, 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 I'm a federal politician. <laughs> I don't try to reach agreement uh, uh, to give the provinces more power. Our recollection of the positions of uh, Mr. Davis, of the position of Mr. Davis, is, uh, is very different and, uh, and well, quite profoundly the different. Will, will the, public, the public will check it tomorrow. And quite, I read uh, an extension. Quite, so what quite he said so. in Toronto on Thursday. Well, quite so. The public, the public will check it tomorrow, and perhaps he'll have an opportunity to set the the record straight himself. Mm -hmm. As to the uh, as to the question of uh, of being able to being able to work with the premiers of, of Canada, of course I think I can do that. And of course, uh, part of the reason I believe it is not simply that seven of those premiers head uh, progressive conservative governments, but also because that has been the practice of every successful Canadian prime minister from Sir John through to Mr. Pearson. It, it really is only Mr. Trudeau who has had this extraordinary difficulty but we were in hearing getting about along. Medicare, that I was uh, agreeing with the provinces yes. too much. You say you'll trust the provinces, but your minister says she won't meet with them. Now, what kind of trust is that? That's nonsense. <laughs> she has but, met with them. But How you, can you say that? <laughs> because I've seen the exchange <laughs> of telexes. Now, the, the point is that every successful Canadian prime minister uh, has, has been able to find a way to work with the premiers of this country. Unfortunately, even with premiers of your own party, uh, you have been involved in, in a state of turmoil with premiers, which has, in my judgment, corroded any basis of trust, which can be the only way this nation works. And I'm convinced that a, uh, that a new national government coming to office uh, with a fresh mandate and with the friendship of the great majority of those premiers will be able to work on their own desire to make the nation work and find agreement where, in 11 years, uh, partly, sir, because of your own style, in 11 years, you've not been able to find that kind of agreement. It seems to me you evaded Mr. DeBarrow's question, which is, what would you do about the Constitution? Well, I would certainly not act uh, unilaterally to bring the Constitution What home. would you do, then? Would you wait another 100 years? Well, or of course not. I, what what you would you do? Have, have a little more faith. Have, have faith that some people other than you uh, might be able tell to, us what to you work would do, out. Mr. Clark, you always talk in generalities. The oh, sure. degree of specificity I'll, seems to I'll tell you to, quite, uh, quite embarrass you. I'll tell you quite specifically what, what we do? would do, uh, to, use, to use your word. What we would do would be to uh, bring together the premiers of Canada uh, to get agreement on areas right now where there can be agreement found.
as I we did in, believe, as we did in February, as right? we did in failed. Oh no, you you, you well, you made you made some progress. You made progress where you adopted some of the proposals that had been put forward by the Conservative Party at the Kingston Conference. Indeed, proposals that you ridiculed at the time, and then, in a dazzling display of consistency, adopted later on. The point is, you don't seem to be very much on top of this dossier. Which which, which proposals in Kingston did we adopt that hadn't been ours since 1969? Oh, well, uh, well, now, which? Uh, perhaps the way to put the question is, which of those uh, that did you adopt that you ridiculed at the time? Which did you say at the time meant that you that I was selling out the shop? You don't provinces? you don't remember and what then, you even decided well, in certainly Kingston? Certainly, the question of equalization. A number of a number of them we could uh, we could go through. Equalization. That's, that's not. Uh, Mr. That's not King really started it. Mr. Saint <laughs> Laurent <laughs> continued it. <laughs> sure. The point is sure. that uh, the point is that you've been singularly unsuccessful in working with the premiers of Canada. I think there's abundant evidence that a change of government would be able to. Uh, work on the good faith towards Canada. The sure. fact that not only the Prime Minister of Canada is a good Canadian, but so are all the, the premiers, uh, with the exception of one who wants to wants to rend the country. So are the rest of the partners in Confederation, uh, good Canadians. And I'm convinced. Well, let's that a talk new specifics, Joe. Yeah. Sure. Would you agree with Premier Lougheed when he wants to limit the federal trade and commerce power? I wouldn't agree with him on, on that, but what I would do, what well, I would do... All right, you wouldn't, so you'd have a disagreement. Just a second, just... And you've just said you'd have disagreements. Of course you'd have disagreements. What's well, different you, between you and me? You what, said what, you would, well, just now you'd change no. your position. You said you <laughs> wouldn't agree with Premier Buchanan on fisheries. You'd said the contrary down in Halifax, That's but now a, you said you wouldn't... That, with respect, sir, is not correct. I didn't say so the contrary never trans, in, in you, Halifax. You wouldn't transfer jurisdiction over fisheries to the provinces, is that right? No, You would not? Of course I would, for the... You would? For the 700th time, I would not. You would not? What I would so do, then you disagree with them. You'd be like me. <laughs> what I would do is recognize that both the provinces about, and the national government what about have an culture? interest in common fields. What about and communication? That they should work together. Gentlemen, it's uh, very difficult for our viewers to follow when you're both talking about this. Now, finish your comment, please, Mr. Clark, and then I'm anxious Mr. Trudeau has an opportunity right. to reply. All right. Let me just quickly, quickly summarize. I think that uh, we've had a quite remarkable period of failure, uh, particularly recently, in your ability to get along with the, with the premiers. I can't blame all of them because it's been as much a problem with a, with a liberal Jerry Regan as it has been with a, with a conservative Bill, Bill Davis or, or Peter Lougheed. I have to suspect that the, that the problem is with the constant participant, uh, with the way that you have approached federal-provincial relations. And I think that is because there has been a determination on your part, since you became prime minister, to concentrate power in Ottawa. You went out and you took power over urban affairs, and you said, we can do that job better than the, than the local governments can. So you took it to Ottawa. Now, you've recognized you're wrong, and you're giving that back. You, you did the same thing in the way you used DRI. DRI is a, is a very important instrument of national policy. But the provincial governments should be given the latitude to decide how that money is spent within their province in a way that is consistent with their own industrial development policies. So what I would do to start with the premiers is to return to the provinces power that had been there before uh, your government centralized power away from them. The second thing I'd do is sit down in a new atmosphere of goodwill and try to find changes, probably in, in minor things, probably in, in, uh, in the way uh, people work together rather than in the, in the language of the law, changes that would demonstrate to anyone who doubted federalism that a new government in Ottawa meant new movement in federal-provincial relations. Well, let's just take a couple of those examples that we centralized power in Ottawa. In 1967, the federal government used to raise 52% of taxes. The provinces, 48. Provinces and municipalities. Ten years later, ten years of Trudeau government, as you call it, it's the country. The federal government raises 47%, and the provinces and the municipalities, 53. Now, there's a real transfer of power, of resources, to the provinces. Through such schemes, as Ed Broadbent and I were discussing earlier, we've given the provinces more power, more access to taxing rules. You talk of DRI, and you sound as though you really don't know what the legislation and the practice is, because that's exactly what we do. We've transferred literally billions of, province, of dollars to the less favored areas of the country, and we've done it in consultation with the provinces. The general agreements are exactly that, and we sign them with all provinces. We say, what area would you like to see developed? Because the province uh, has to be in complete agreement with the area of the country that we want to develop. And they say, well, it's this, and we like roads, and we... So we say, well, fine, let's see, sign agreement. Elsewhere, it's forestry. And the result is here again, another interesting statistic. In 1970, some 8,000 people a year were leaving the Atlantic region, a net emigration of the Atlantic region. After 
seven years of DRI, 24,000 people had a net immigration into the Maritimes. That's due to your policy. Gentlemen, I, I'm terribly it's sorry. We've simply run out of time. The third round uh, has expired. Our time for the third round has expired. And uh, our debating period time has expired. We now come to the closing area. Each leader will have up to four minutes for his closing remarks. As you know, the order of speaking is the reverse of the opening statements. Mr. Broadbent will go first, then Mr. Trudeau, and finally Mr. Clark. Mr. Broadbent, please. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think the people of Canada who are still watching this program uh, will have seen uh, what has concerned me through most of the campaign. We have just witnessed with uh, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Clark the discussion of such esoteric, uh, albeit important from time to time, uh, matters as reform of Parliament, uh, uh, bringing back the Constitution, uh, uh, personal abuse as one man of good judgment, as another man of good judgment. But I must say very directly, if I were uh, a farmer in Saskatchewan or a, a cab driver in Vancouver, a fisherman in Newfoundland or a, a bank clerk in downtown Toronto, I'd wonder uh, what politics is all about in this 1979 election. Medicare legislation, the Prime Minister has admitted his government brought in a measure that has permitted Tory provincial governments across the country to virtually destroy the principle of universality, to reintroduce one system of Medicare for the rich and one for the poor. We have been the only party to speak about that in the campaign for obvious reasons. We're opposed to it. Mr. Clark supported that legislation when it was brought in. We want to get back to universal Medicare. On the issue of prices, uh, neither Mr. Clark nor Mr. Trudeau really talked about inflation. I mentioned it in my opening statement. Surely when prices are going up much more rapidly than wages of ordinary workers, we should have a fair prices commission that will roll back unfair price increases. Both Mr. Clark and Mr. Trudeau voted against it. Uh, other very practical matters. I mentioned in my opening statement the problem of uh, our grain farmers in Saskatchewan. The expectation is our exports are going to increase by 50% by 1985. But the real problem is we don't have a grain handling system that will be able to, to meet their needs for the export. We've committed ourselves to the Hall Royal Commission. Mr. Trudeau's government is, is busy uh, destroying branch lines that will be badly needed. Mr. Clark has remained virtually silent uh, until very recently, and then he said that uh, he would uh, get rid of some branch lines, but maybe not others. In short, in terms of the real issues that bother Canadians, whether it's prices or, or farm problems or particularly uh, unemployment, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Clark, we've just seen it, ignored most of them in their, in their so-called serious debate. And the other point I want to make is in virtually all the matters I've listed, they're in substantial, if not identical, agreement. But the one that stands out head and shoulders above all the others for me is that Mr. Clark clearly wants to be Prime Minister. But I still have no perception of a different kind of Canada for Mr. Clark. Does it differ from Mr. Trudeau? He wants a little more financial control in Parliament. He wants some parliamentary reforms. He says he'd be cooperative with the Premiers. But does that really make a Canada? that's more exciting, that's more decent. And I have argued throughout this campaign that what's fundamental to that, what's essential to that, is the recognition of, of something that we really have and use it, and that is resources. In Newfoundland, we export most of our iron ore. In my home province of Ontario, we've got nickel, we've got copper, we've got zinc. We're exporting it. In the prairies, uh, the government of uh, Mr. Trudeau wants to export their alleged uh, surplus of natural gas. British Columbia has resources. And the central thrust of our campaign, and my campaign as, as Prime Minister of this country, is that it's time for a change. It is really time that we set about the serious task of controlling our own resources. It's not a short Thank you, Mr. Task, Broadbent. I'm sorry. But it You've run to be out of done time. Now. Thank you so very much. Mr. Trudeau, please. Well, I. When Ed uh, began speaking, I wondered if he'd been at the same debate as we had. Uh, he's been able to put in his program and his policies, but uh, surely many of the subjects which uh, he says we haven't treated have been dealt with. We've dealt with inflation, and it seems to me quite clear that both of you now agree that we should increase the deficits, uh, maybe only for three or four years, you probably for longer. We should increase the deficits, and we all know that increased deficits will increase inflation. 
jobs we've talked a great deal about. Energy, I regret that we haven't talked more about. Uh, I do admit that you and Mr. You, Ed, and, and Mr. Clark uh, talked uh, uh, somewhat about energy in Petro-Canada. I beg the chairman to let us turn to energy, but the gentleman uh, from the press wanted to talk about other things. But uh, on energy, after all, we created Petro-Canada. We set one price for Canada. And when Mr. Clark was saying that Petro-Canada hadn't discovered one drop of oil, of course, he's just ignorant that Petro-Canada helped save Syncrude, which is producing oil, synthetic oil. He's ignorant, but it was in the papers just a couple of days ago, that a joint venture which went ahead with Petro-Canada has just found one trillion cubic feet of gas on Sable Island, a project that had been abandoned until Petro-Canada got into it. Uh, on the price of energy, I'm sorry we didn't discuss it, but it's quite obvious that it's our policy that has permitted Canadians across com the country to pay less than the national price of oil. But I, I, can't, I can't control uh, the debate. We didn't deal with everything, Mr. Broadbent, but just talking about prices and food, you say you want to control the prices of food, but you don't want to control... Wages, you don't want, you, you voted against, you want it. Well, well, exactly. But you can't just control prices without controlling the input. Because you have the year of big labor, uh, obviously you don't like to talk about controlling wages, but you want to control prices. And you haven't said how constitutionally it would be possible to roll back prices at this particular the kind of time. The legislation Mr. Gray was going to bring in. Yeah, Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray might, is, not, uh, is not a minister, but certainly... At some times, when there's an emergency, the Supreme Court might, might judge that you can have rollback legislation. But you know that we have no jurisdiction at this time to roll back the prices of food. You should know that. Therefore, you propose something that we voted against because it wasn't constitutionally possible. But once again, the Liberal Party stands, uh, as I am tonight, in the middle of a party of big labor and of big business. And we're still the party that brought in Medicare, that brought in old age pensions, that brought in family allowances, and more recently the child tax credit, a party which is in the tradition of Laurier, which brought the French Canadians into, into the Liberal Party, and Mr. Pearson, who set up the Bilingual and Bicultural Commission, the tradition of Mr. King, the tradition of Mr. Pearson, who created old age pensions and family allowances, which we recently enriched and indexed. This is the party that has always thought of the little people, the people who, for whom the, all this social legislation, including Medicare, including hospital insurance, was bought in by, by Mr. St. Laurent, by Mr. Pearson, by myself. And this is the party which is concerned with people, whether it be on the economic side, on the social side, or in terms of human rights and legislation which will ensure equality of all Canadians. It's a party that wants to build for the future with the help of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Clark, our final speaker, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. It is, it is difficult, I think, for any of us to cover all the topics that we would want to in, uh, in a debate of this kind. Certainly, I would have wanted to spend much more time on jobs because I think that uh, it's fundamental that we <coughs> no longer accept in this country that there will be a million Canadians out of work. That's why we've proposed the Mortgage Deductibility Program, which people expert in that field think would create 100,000 new jobs in, uh, in, this, in the first year of operation alone and a number of other programs. Uh, Mr. Broadbent and I agree that uh, that has to be a priority, that we can't be satisfied with where we are. But I think really the fundamental problem that we face in the country is that we've had now in this country 11 years really of turmoil when it has been very, when it's been much easier to find Canadians who fight with one another than it has been to find Canadians who are prepared to work together. And I think that a large part of the the fault there lies with the manner in which the present government has acted towards its partners. Because a nation like this is a partnership. It's a partnership between the federal government and the provinces. It's a partnership also between people who are in public life and people who are in private life, whether they're running businesses or active in labor unions or in voluntary or community organizations. And what we have to do, I think, is end that turmoil and restore again some sense of this community working together. And there's all sorts of reason in Canada for us to do that because we're an immensely rich nation. We're, we're, we're more fortunate than any other nation you can name, any other nation you can think of. And the particular need in Canada now is for the kind of leadership that can draw strong people together, make sure that all the regions, all the groups who have concerns about the future of Canada are represented, and then bring direction to that common whole. 
I want to build on the strengths of this country. I want to help individuals build on those strengths. I want people who want to own homes to find it easier to own homes. I want young people who are looking for skills to have the help of their government as we're proposing their help uh, to get those kinds <coughs> of skills, to get that kind of work experience. I think we're very fortunate here. Speaking of resources, just for a moment, since the, Mr. Trudeau was, I think it's a crime that in this country, with all of the energy resources we have, we are still depending for so much of our supply upon foreign countries. We are unique among nations in that we could be self-sufficient in energy by the year 1990 if we had a national policy that encouraged that kind of development. That's the kind of building work that I want to do, and I want to do it with the partnership of the people of Canada. My colleagues and I, a new team of Canadians, confident in this country, eager to have the chance to govern it, ask for that kind of support on the 22nd of May, because the, the partnership wouldn't end on Election Day. Our view of Canada is that it is a community, a community of communities, where people have to work together, and that is the way we proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Gentlemen, I regret very much that our time is up. I would like uh, very much to thank the leaders for being here tonight and participating in this very lively discussion. Gentlemen of the press, thank you. Thank you for initiating a very useful and, I think, provocative exchange of views. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us tonight. Good evening.